All right, the sports editor is very grateful to chat to a broadcast legend, brilliant DJ, F1 enthusiast, <laughs> and all around great person, none other than Sasha Martinengo. Sasha, what a pleasure. Great to, you, to have you on the show. But I'd like to start off with the first question is that what brought um, you to have such an interest in, in motorsport? Uh, thanks, Ryan. Man. Uh, nice intro. Very, very humbled by that. Um, my interest in motorsport just began when I was a very, very young boy. You know, I, I was one of those who grew up and liked cars. And, um, and um, my dad uh, took me to my first race when I was like six or seven years old. And um, I just got fascinated by, by racing and by cars and by just, you know, people in suits, racing suits. And, uh, and I loved it. And because, um, you know, I'm of Italian descent, um, you know, Ferrari was there and, and that was, that was it, you know, you just, they're the red cars and, you know, the dad showed you and said, you know, that's who you support. And since then I've just fallen in love with all forms of motor racing, but specifically Formula One. Right. Excellent. So yes, Italian descent and, and, and Ferrari, but you've got a bit of a soft spot for Alfa Romeo. So how does this all fit in? Yeah, well, you know, Alfa Romeo is is my in my heart. I mean, just as yeah. Ferrari is in terms of racing, but Alfa Romeo. Um, I, I just remember I, my late grandfather had an Alfa Romeo. I think it was a Berliner. I can't even remember. And I just loved Alfa, and I grew up just loving Alfa Romeos. I don't know why. Um, I just loved the their style and design. And yes, they were Italian. And yeah, amazingly, um, I was very fortunate that my my parents, you know, bought me my first car. And at that stage, all of my friends were asking their parents for um, GTIs. The first GTIs came out, the Golf GTIs. And uh, my dad said, well, what about that? And I said, no, Dad, uh, Alfa Romeo, Alfa Romeo. <laughs> and uh, he just sat there, nodded his head, and he said, OK. And, and you know, that's my first car was an Alfa Romeo. And, and I'm sure my last car will ever be an Alfa Romeo. So you're obviously driving Alfa Romeo right now, as it is as well. Well, I'm driving a, an Abarth, a Fiat Abarth 500, a 595, <laughs> but um, um, yeah. I've always driven, driven Alfa Romeo's and I, I think at the last count, um, owned and driven, owned and, and, um, and yeah, driven Alfa Romeo's, I think I'm, I'm over 30 now. <laughs> wow, that's incredible. That's pure dedication no, but, I, but, but I don't have any, unfortunately. I've <laughs> sold them all over the years. Okay, <laughs> Uh, that's great commitment but but let's, let's just slowly work, work our way into formula one and you mentioned alfa romeo there and i think alfa romeo got a, a lovely driver in valtteri bottas um how have you found in the season i think he's exceptional although maybe things haven't gone all the way that he wanted what sort of your take been um for this first half of the season with particularly bottas driving alfa romeo yeah well i've been a fan of bottas since mm -hmm. um since i saw him for the first time in 2007 in in turkey driving in gp3 and i came back to south africa and i said watch out for this guy i think he's really really good and i think he did a brilliant job as a teammate of lewis hamilton um i think you know he just wasn't as good as as lewis but he was still a very very accomplished driver and, and we've mm -hmm. seen that for whoever he's driven for alfa romeo sauber um, are one of those strange teams uh, over the years they one of the teams that start off they either start off really well or end off really well and then they sort of have this lapse during the middle and this year we've seen them start off fantastically uh, Valtteri had a brilliant first five or six races and since then they they've just gone off the boil you know and um, somehow the updates haven't worked we know they've got a strong engine yet it might be a little bit um, unreliable in terms of the Ferrari power unit but it's a very very strong engine and I'm hoping that perhaps after the summer break Sauber have some new uh, parts that come onto the car because the car is worthy of a lot of top 10 finishes especially in the hands of, of Valtteri because he's you know he knows how to get that car into the points you know he learned a lot um, in his tenure at Mercedes. Definitely, uh, and as soon as he did move across, I thought, you know, Alfa Romeo are going to love the fact that he's there, and just things are going to mm. flow. But I'm sure, like you said, the second half of the season, we're going to see a lot more happening. That so, well, I hope it just opens up the competition even more. Sure. But if 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 you could put anyone in Alfa Romeo car, Formula One driver, who would that be? Um, you know what? I would love to have had Alfa Romeo this year, uh, Valtteri and Kimi. 
Um, I think the two of them uh, would have been yeah. fantastic. But if they were, if they, if you're looking at drivers who are on the grid right now, um, I think they've got a very strong pairing. I, again, I'd love to see. Yeah, I, I think I think Valtteri and and Wang Yu Zhou are really really accomplished racing drivers. I wouldn't want to steal anybody from from anywhere else. I think Valtteri and and Wang Yu Zhou. Um, have got the ability to get that car in the points. So, yeah, it'd be great. But I would love to see um, a guy like Max Verstappen in, in an Alfa Romeo, you know, mm -hmm. just to see, because I really rate Max as, as most probably one of the best drivers I've ever seen in, in, in Formula One racing. And what do you think? Yes, I know that the, the Max has been there since, you know, knee high to a grasshopper and they've, motorsport's been ingrained in them from you know, such a young age. But what do you think does set Max Max apart? I mean, is it his reaction time? What just makes him that so much more better? It's such a great question because you know the 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 difference between a great driver and a good driver is just a tenth or two. Mm. It's not much, you know. Um, it's very very rare that you get a driver on the grid that really shouldn't be there. And, you know, I say that with, with a great amount of respect. We know we have a lot of paid drivers. And one could go and slam various names and say those people didn't deserve to be there. But somehow they did get there. But the difference between a great driver, Sebastian Vettel, and Mark Webber was a tenth, a tenth and a half of a second. The difference between Lewis Hamilton and, and Valtteri Bottas was, was a tenth, two, two tenths of a, of a second. So, that you know, they are all really, really good drivers. Yeah. But I do think, you know... Every generation, just somehow, somebody just comes out and just lights up. You know, we, we saw it, I think, with, with Ayrton Senna. We saw it with Michael yeah, yeah. Schumacher. We saw it with Fernando Alonso. We've seen it with uh, Sebastian Vettel. We've seen it with Lewis Hamilton. Um, and now you've got Max Verstappen. And yes, I rate people like Charles Leclerc right up with him. George Russell, Lando Norris, pretty close to him as well. Yeah. But Max has just got something that, he can drive around any kind of issue and do and get the most out of the car. You know, he, he reminds me a lot of, uh, of Michael Schumacher in the way that he just has that ability to drive around issues, to get the most out of the car and even overdrive the car um, and, and get the results. Yeah, there's something, something very special about Max Verstappen. Definitely. No, I agree with everything that you're saying then. It, it is quite unique to see. But I just want to touch on, you mentioned Charles Leclerc as well. I mean, what a fantastic driver. We've got to give that guy credit. And if he hadn't had a few incidents, I think it would be neck and neck at the top at the moment. But do you feel that um, it's going to come down to those two for who wins the title this season? I would love to love to see it um, come down to the two of them. I think Ferrari have made too many mistakes and had a couple uh, of too many DNFs at the moment for them to try and claw back. They do seem to have a little bit of a reliability issue with that uh, Ferrari power unit. Mm -hmm. But um, having said that, I mean, Charles Leclerc uh, in Austria this past weekend showed that, you know, when that car is really working, he is a phenomenal racing driver. He really has something very, very special. Mm -hmm. And I rate him right up there with, with Max Verstappen. So, you know, I would love to see uh, no DNFs for uh, Max, but, you know, Ferrari to claw back the points with with um, with Charles Leclerc and let's hope after the summer break you know there's only 15 points or 10 points between the two of them I think that would be magical for the last sort of eight races absolutely definitely and do you think it's it's pretty much um, out of the window now for Mercedes-Benz too far behind or maybe um, Toto Wolff has got a plan um, for next season that he's maybe holding back a bit or what's your gut feel on Mercedes-Benz where are they at the moment yeah, if you look at them uh, in the last few races and their results, and especially Lewis Hamilton, you know, he's, he's been on the podium all three races. And yeah. that just shows you the mark of a great champion. He knows how to get that car into the points and onto the champ, uh, onto the, the, the podium. Yeah. Um, I think Mercedes are waiting to see with what this FIA uh, regulation change is going to be about these flexi floors and porpoising, et cetera, um, and hidden boards under the, the, the you know hood, hidden planks under the on the boards um and whether or not it's going to affect the likes of red bull and ferrari um in particular um 
from there, of course, they've got to be looking to the future as well, because we have these regulations for the next three years as well. But I think the improvement that Mercedes have done from the begin from where they started to where they are now, you can never discount them. Yeah. But I do think um, perhaps maybe for the constructors championship, but for a driver's championship, it will take, I, I think, a miracle for Sorry. Mercedes to to top um, Red Bull. Um, but, you know, stranger things have happened in Formula One. But <laughs> yeah. I, I, I think it's going to take a mighty effort to beat Max Verstappen. Yeah. Oh, this is interesting. But yeah, looking forward to it. But Sasha, you touched on something that even I get a bit frustrated on, you know, watching a weekend because we'll be watching a race. And maybe someone, you know, sort of overtaking and is ahead of that, the driver and then gets nudged and he ends up going off the circuit. And then certain races, that driver will get penalized. And then the next race, he doesn't get penalized. And the commentators will refer back to that saying, but hey, this incident happened last weekend and nothing seems to, to happen. I don't know. It, it, there seems to be quite a few gray areas in terms of the rules. Um, or am I misreading it here? And and why can't it be black and white? Or is it just that the guys who are on duty for that weekend just interpret the rules differently? I, 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 you know, how does it work? <laughs> yeah, listen, I've been saying it for the last 15 years. All we want is consistency. Yeah. But it is more complicated than that because you do see one incident in one race and, and you think now that's a very similar incident in the race that has just happened and surely the same penalty must, must apply. I think it's an incredibly, incredibly difficult job being a, a Formula One steward um, because, you know, did, did the incident happen? W were there low, were there high fuel um, loads in the car? Were the tires warm enough um, when that incident happened? Whereas another incident might have happened where the tires were warm enough and the, and the fuel loads were a lot less. So you would sit there and say, well, maybe the driver could have made the corner as opposed to, well, his tires were a little bit cold. So you've got to look at so many factors as an, as an FIA steward. But what you say is right. If, for example, the, the, uh, the incident looks the same, regardless of those, those um, uh, parameters, then surely the penalty must must be the same. Yeah. We all do want to have uh, an element of, of consistency, but I, I do think it is a very difficult one. And there are times where I've, I've sat and gone, I can't believe they've given a penalty for that. And then I've gone, well, that deserves a penalty and no penalty is given. So yeah, I think as fans, we do get very frustrated. We must respect and understand that they have, the, the stewards have, many more cameras than what we see they right. see it from various different angles as well sure. and then they make a decision from that mm -hmm. it is then up to the team if the team wants to lodge a complaint of course they can go and lodge lodge complaints most of the times they don't win those those kind of complaints but i think as fans we do get frustrated and sometimes we um allow our emotions to take over because it might be our driver that is involved in the incident you know yeah. somebody that we're supporting and we go oh i can't believe what the stewards have done so they have to be very impartial they have to be incredibly um, objective when they make these uh with these decisions i wouldn't want to to do that job no. um because I, I think I wouldn't have many friends uh, up and down the pit lane. But yeah, I, I do agree that, you know, we do want a little bit more consistency, which, which would be favorable. But no, there is no black and white. There is yeah. always going to be some gray when it comes to incidents um, in terms of penalties. Besides, you know, infringements like speeding in the pit lane, crossing white lines, yeah. those are black and white. For the Absolutely. rest of it... Uh, Racing incidents, not too sure. <laughs> you know, it just makes me think, and this will probably be a discussion for many more years, is, you know, look at last year's winner when um, it came down to the last race between Max Verstappen and Lewis Hamilton. And now mm. the rules seem to, from what Mercedes was saying, the rules seem to change right there and then, you know, with the, the unlapping guys and <laughs> it, was just, it just seemed to be chaos. But now it led to Max winning. And now you're dealing with literally millions on the line, you know, millions of, of dollars or whatever it is. So... Yeah, it's, it's really interesting how they, they deal with it all. But yeah, like I said, let them do it. They can do it. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, I, I think let's just let's just go back to, to Abu Dhabi 2021. And, right. you know, it was incredibly emotional. And mm. Michael Massey now, unfortunately, has actually left the FIA and he's gone back to Australia. He had a very, very tough time. And he only made one mistake. He made one mistake in the fact that he didn't allow the rest of the cars to overtake. 
That yeah. was it. Had he allowed the rest of the cars to overtake, Max would have still overtaken Lewis. That's it. They still would have had a one racing lap and Max would have overtaken Lewis because yeah. he was on the fresher tyres. If you look at the Silverstone Grand Prix where we had all of a sudden Carlos Sainz coming into the pits and Charles Leclerc was left out, it's not dissimilar to what happened to uh, Lewis Hamilton in Abu Dhabi, although the championship was not on the line. To put your driver from the front is a very, very difficult um, decision because now all of a sudden, if something goes wrong in the pits, you lose your track position. The only thing, yeah, the only thing that that, Mac, uh, that, that Michael Massey got wrong was he should have allowed all of the other uh, um, overtaken cars to unlap themselves. Sure, Besides that, sure. he had every... Um, every right to make the call that he did in terms of what the, the regulations say. Um, and you can go and read that up. It basically says that the race director has the veto to decide on any rule change under safety car procedures. Wow. However, the rest of the world yeah. doesn't like to look at it that way. Right. Um, and, and in my opinion, yes, he, he, he erred, um, in not allowing the other cars to be overtaken. But, uh, you know, that that um, that story will go on forever. Yeah, but it definitely clears the air for, air for me. So thank you, Sasha. Yeah, because it's it's nice to hear it from that where it's, it's clear and that's what happened. It's good. It's very, very, but yeah, it's sad to see him leave, but unfortunately that it is what it is in, in that regard. But now I also wanted to ask you, that Drive to Survive show, I'm, I'm sure you've seen one or two episodes. <laughs> is, yeah. it, is it a true reflection of F1 and how these guys live their lives, or is it half time a bit? Your, your thoughts on that? Because it's at times it's like, sure, okay, interesting, but yeah, well, let it be. I, number one, you've got to take your hat off to the Americans. The Americans know how to make pizzazz, they know how to make entertainment, they know how to, to build brands, and that's what they've yeah. done. Since Liberty have taken over Formula One, um, they brought in a whole lot of new followers to the sport. Um, a, a, a younger generation as well um, and through shows like Drive to Survive when Drive to Survive first came out and I watched the first season and I watched it and I went oh this is so exciting and so many people you know I've been harping on and talking about these things for years and years and people didn't believe what I was saying and I went yeah but now you can see that it's there so the first season I thoroughly enjoyed um, and th there were times I went okay it's a little bit Hollywood Personally, um, I only watched, I think, one episode of the last season, um, and I think it's become a little bit too Hollywood for me, yeah. but I do understand what its appeal, because there are a lot of people who love Formula One, um, but maybe don't study it as religiously as I do, and and from there, they get they get their satisfaction by knowing, well, you know, that okay. there's there, there are a few little... Um, confrontations and uh, you know you know drivers and, and team managers that don't like each other and that's the kind of excitement they get out of it me I'm more I want to know what's going on and um, and I can read the story myself without watching uh, something like like drive to survive but you know those who, who love to watch it fantastic you know you are learning at least something uh, from it and it does make the racing more exciting when you watch it as opposed to you know so many people just going oh cars just go round and round and round and I go man if you just uh, understood what yeah, this is about exactly you would really really um, uh, embrace it no no Formula One is a unique sport I, I tell you what mm. it is incredible what these guys achieve and, and sure. talking about its uniqueness um when you look at the makeup of each car, and I always scratch my head and say, how do they make the cars better every season? It's like, they, if they can take off half a second, Sasha, they will do it. I mean, do these guys literally sit there and pinpoint every single little angle to make the car better? Is that what happens? I mean, I don't know if you can fill me in with a bit more of that, because it just blows my mind how they always find a way to get quicker. Yeah, it is extraordinary, Ryan, and and it is that's why it is Formula One, and that's why it's the pinnacle of motorsport, and that's why we love it so much because these engineers, designers, um, uh, just anybody technical involved in producing a Formula One car, and besides the driver, are working within tiny parameters to find the tiniest kind of improvement um, yeah. that they can try and get the car to get give the driver in order to improve a lap time and it is fascinating to to watch and to understand and if you consider that there now are budget constraints there's also a limited amount of time that they can go into to wind tunnels limited testing it's extraordinary 
the ability of these engineers and designers to come up um, year after year and make these cars better, including the tire manufacturers as well. Um, it, it's just wonderful. I mean, it's just fantastic mm. to, to, to understand the level of genius um, of, of the people involved in Formula One. No, like you said, that's why it's such a, a great, great thing to watch. Yeah. I can't wait for it when it's on. It really is it's fantastic. <laughs> it really is good. But Sasha, a big talking point for, for quite a while now, and I see some headlines and there's been a few things posted. Formula One in South Africa, man oh man, is it going to happen? Any news or any insight you can give it to us? I mean, surely there's smoke, there's fire. Come on, it has to happen. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I agreed. It, where there's smoke, there's fire. And, yeah. and I think we should all be excited about it. Yeah. Um, and, and I do believe, I really do believe that there's an announcement that's going to come out in the next couple of weeks. I'm, I'm anticipating uh, yeah. over the weekend of the, the Hungarian Grand Prix. Right. It might even be before that. But I'm firmly, I firmly believe 99% um, that an announcement is going to be made that South Africa will return to the Formula One calendar from next year either in April, um, an April date, or perhaps maybe August, September, somewhere around there. Oh, no. um, and I'm, I'm so excited about it. You yeah. know, I, there's so many rumors going around. Oh, and the track needs, you know, Kyle Army needs to have runoff areas at uh, Clubhouse and runoff areas at uh, Sunset and techno barriers at this. And then on the other side, I hear the track's perfect and they just need techno barriers. Then one minute I'm hearing there's a courier company. Then I hear there's a bank. Then I'm hearing there's a petroleum company that's going to be the sponsor. Yeah, we, we have to be patient and let's take the rumors from whence they come. And um, I've also been responsible for posting some of those rumors uh, around, but I'm very excited, Ryan. And I do, I, I do believe that, that a positive announcement is going to come very soon and yeah. will be on the calendar. And we cannot afford not to have a Formula One race without Lewis Hamilton right. in Africa. Yeah. It's so important that we do have Formula One while Lewis is still around because Lewis is not going to be around for that much longer. I'd, I mean, I'd yeah. like him to be around, but yeah. I don't think he's going to be around. But having um, Lewis Hamilton performing in South Africa in Africa is vital yeah. to um, getting Formula One here. And it's, it's got to be from next year. End of story. Definitely. No, I hear what you're saying. And I th that'll make a lot of sense. And I think, you know, you can look at it from so many different factors. Like you mentioned, yes, Lewis Hamilton from being in South Africa, that's important. The financial aspects, that's brilliant. It, it increases yes. the knowledge of the sport. There's so many positives. I don't see how anyone can look at it from a negative point of view. So fully agree with you on all the statements there. Really, really necessary. Um, are there quite a few financial implications to get it into South Africa? You know, will it cost quite a lot? Or was it like you said, actually, you know, we set up, we can do this, we've done it before. So just just a wrap. Is it is it that simple? Or was there a bit of money where we have to sort of maybe fork out to I, make it all happen? I, I think it's a lot of money, okay. um, Ryan. And also don't forget our money is not worth a lot um so so when somebody let let's let's hypothetically say um i'll tell you saudi arabia pays a hundred million dollars a year to formula one to host a grand prix there's no way south africa number one could afford a hundred million dollars or will pay a hundred million dollars so there's there must be incredible negotiations going on between yeah. formula one and the consortium called south african grand prix and they right. would have come to some deal and said, listen, to host a Grand Prix, we can't afford $100 million. S some countries are paying $25 million. Why don't we do a deal at $15 million? For example, I'm just hy hypothesizing over here. Yeah. Then the one thing that I have heard um, through you know, various sources is that we are not going to have government involved in terms of money. Right. Okay. So we're not going to have the Minister of Sports saying, yes, okay, we are going to fund the Grand Prix. Here's our money up front. I think this is all going to come from private individuals. But having said that, that is just rumor. I don't know. Maybe Minister of Sport does come out and says, don't worry, we're going to handle it. So whoever is negotiating these deals will have to pay a lot of money. All of the sponsorship, all of the um, uh, paddock club, uh, advertising revenue, television rights, all goes to Formula One. Mm. Okay. 
So the promoter, for example, Kyle Army, doesn't really make any money. Oh. Kyle Army has to make money on tickets, on ticket sales. Okay. So, yes, there is a lot of money. And the owners of Kyle Army aren't also just going to sit there and say, oh, yes, come and use my facility and I'm going to run at a loss. There's no ways they're going to do that. So they're going to negotiate as well. So, yes, there is big money involved. How much money? Maybe we will find out um, when, when this announcement comes out. But I do believe that we do have the, um, the benefactors in South Africa and the right kind of people getting behind this bid and to put it together and ensure that for the foreseeable future and whether it's a three-year contract, five-year contract, 10-year contract, it will be sustainable and there won't be any shortcomings because if something negative does happen, we'll never get Formula One again. Yeah, true, true. And it's almost like Formula One are saying, you know, we're doing you a favor, so you pay us and then you'll we'll benefit from it. And I really believe South Africa will benefit from it immensely, more than I think what people oh. can imagine. Oh, 100%. You know, the tourist, tourist uh, in, influx of, of people is unbelievable. And, uh, you know, there have been uh, documents and reports that have come out over the years that, you know, if you've got a five-year deal, after three years, you can actually make a su substantial profit from the running of the event. For the rest of it, people are going to come out here, their money is worth tons here they're going to go to they're going to go to parks they're going to go to cape town they're going to go all over the country so i mean man it's going to be fantastic for the country no it will be it will be definitely oh sasha no excited i really hope good news does come out soon man hey but so. when do you think we're gonna see another racer like jody Schechter from south africa Yo, you know, we have such unbelievable talent in this country. And I'm, I, I really mean that. Um, from p kid, kids in go-karts mm. to going into single-seaters, into tin-top racing, um, we really do have the talent. Uh, the question is also the funding. Um, you yeah. know, for, for a young kid uh, to go and race in Formula 3 or Formula 2 in, in, in Europe is, is going to cost anything between 3 and 7 million euros. Sure. All right. So just put that in, in money. Yeah, you you yeah. know, let's say, Ryan, you've got a little kid and you say, oh, fantastic. Oh, my kid's going to go and race in, in Europe. You've got to have plenty, plenty money to do that. Okay. But we do have some significant racing drivers in Europe and America at the moment. Jordan okay. Pepper, um, the two van der Linde brothers, Calvin and, and Sheldon van der Linde. We've got Dave Perrell. We've got a whole lot of mm -hmm. racing drivers that are doing their trade. And I would say that between Jordan Pepper and the two Funder Linda drivers, if they continue the way that they are driving in DTM and in uh, GT uh, championships, also uh, kids like Stuart White, who knows if one of the teams don't all of a sudden just sit there and say, hey, Sheldon, Calvin, Jordan, he has a test in a Formula One car. <laughs> the likes of Audi uh, coming into Formula One, Porsche coming into Formula One are also significantly high. Yeah, Calvin van der Linde is an Audi driver. Wow. Um, so you know there are there is still potential um, for these these guys to perhaps have a test drive in in Formula One to see how good they are. In terms of the youngsters, um, we've just got to nurture you know those kids who are in karting and and hopefully with Formula One coming to South Africa that'll inspire other sponsors to sit there and say, hey, let's take uh, Simpiwe and Gavin and Charlotte and let's take them to Europe and let's see how they can do. I'm hoping uh, that that is, is something that can happen. Excellent. Like you said, we've got so much talent, you know, and mm. I, yeah, I say here in, in Cape Town and it's um, Kalani and these guys are going buzzing around and it's, the energy is there, the love for it is there, man. It's definitely totally. the potential and it's, it's true. Yeah. It's really, really good to see. So, Jana, I've got a few more questions. So, you bear, bear with me, Sasha. So, <laughs> sure. But what, what has been your favorite Formula One race to, that you've witnessed live? What one did you really stand out for you? Well, I suppose my first international race back in 1993 at Monza. Um, and uh, it was nearly a Ferrari win, but uh, Damon Hill won ahead of Jean Lacey. <laughs> so, uh, that, was, that was quite special. Um, watching Sebastian Vettel win for Toro Rosso at Monza was an incredible thrill. 
Um, I, it was so special because here was a guy that you just knew was going to do something very, very special. I've been very lucky to watch um, uh, Michael Schumacher win in Italy wow. for Ferrari, which was outstanding. Um, uh, Alonso winning uh, at Silverstone in a Ferrari was also very, very special. But I think in 2006, Michael Schumacher's last race at Brazil, um, at the Monza race, he announced he was retiring from Formula One. And the following day, I just sat there and uh, I think I sold half one of my kids, um, a few cars, and I booked my ticket and went to Brazil. And I said, I've got to watch Schumacher race his, his last race. And it was an outstanding race. I mean, he, 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 he crashed in qualifying. He started from the back and he eventually finished, I think, fourth or sure. sixth. It, it was just fantastic to watch Michael uh, Schumacher race his last race for Ferrari. Of course, he came back with Mercedes a few years later. But yeah, to me, that was most probably so far one of the most one of the most special races ever was watching Schumacher's last race um, for Ferrari in Brazil. Man, that's awesome. Yeah, I know it's the thrill. I have been able to witness it live like you, but maybe one day I will. I'm, I'm convinced. I'm sure you will. But, uh, I'm the sure you energy will. <laughs> and the, the 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 speed. It just yeah. Man, oh man. No, it's mind-boggling, mind-boggling. Yeah. yeah, that's excellent. But um, you, you bring Formula One to South Africa in the sense that you have a Let's Go Racing show, and I believe that's quite entertaining, and you're really trying to get Formula One you know, fans hungry, or even more hungry for it, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I, I, I'm glad you mentioned that, Ryan. You know, I did super sport for 17 years, but yeah, I've, I've done th 30 years of promoting Formula One. Since 1993, when we had our last race, for 30 years, I've been banging the drum of Formula One on radio, uh, in articles, um, and, and you know, in some kind of small little way, you know, I've, I, I hope that I've got people more excited about it, more people watching it over the years. And to see it return to 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 South Africa would be something amazing. You know, I was there at the last Grand Prix in, in Kailami in 1993, um, and it and it was amazing. You know, it, it just what you know, Senna was there, Prost was there, Mansell was there, um, Schumacher. Yeah. You know, it was the first time I'd seen Michael Schumacher. Uh, you know, race, um, and it, it was also the first time I'd seen Senna um, race live. Um, little did I know that I would see them both race. Uh, later on that year in Monza for the first time that I went there. But, you know, I've been very blessed to to sit there and live my passion and, and you know, as opposed to just talk about it, go and try and find it and understand it even more and and try and, you know, get people to, to uh, you know, embrace uh, the passion that I have for it. Maybe not as much, but, you know, just to sit there when, they, when they're watching it and go, Man, I, I I get what Sasha's on about. You know, this the, it's quite a cool show. It's quite quite cool to watch. <laughs> well, Sasha, I can tell you honestly, you had an effect on me because I remember growing up, and I remember you talking about Formula One. And since then, I've been like, okay, I've got to watch this because what you're saying, you know, you make such a hype about it. This has got to be good. And since then, yeah, it, it took oh, a bit. Yeah, took a bit when Marco Schumacher called it a day. But now it's I was like back into it. Let's go. It's it's awesome. It's awesome. And Sasha, as we sort of draw towards an end, um, and, and maybe, I don't know if you can answer this question, but who would be the greatest driver of all in your mind? And I don't know if we can answer that one properly, because I mean, there has been so many good, good races. You mentioned Senna before, Michael Schumacher, Lewis Hamilton. It's actually difficult um, to put it on, but maybe if we could give your top three in no particular order, maybe that'll answer the question a bit better. Yeah, I, I think, you know, it's an ongoing debate, Ryan, you know, mm -hmm. who's the greatest of all time? Yeah. Cars are different. Uh, technologies yeah. are, are different. Um, I never saw Fangio race, but I believe he was unbelievable. I never watched Jim Clark race, but I believe he was extraordinary. Mm -hmm. um, you know, from the people that I've seen race, uh, Michael Schumacher, Ayrton Senna, Max Verstappen, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Lewis Hamilton, Fernando Alonso, Sebastian Vettel. Proper. Proper. And, then, and then I would say, I think Charles Leclerc could, could well get up there. Yeah. But at present, those would be my top five in no particular order. Yeah. Hamilton, Senna, Schumacher, Alonso, Vettel. But how does Alonso do it at 40 years of age? My goodness me. 
Yeah, it's a young man's game. <laughs> and I say that very respectfully. It is because yeah. react, like I said, with reaction time, the, you know, there's high, there's high speed corners, all of that. It's like, wow, how does he, how does he do it? And it's, it's incredible. Well, you know, it, 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 he just was unfortunate that, you know, when he went to, to McLaren, McLaren just were really looking after the British side of them. And we've seen that as years go on. They are very British uh, organization, although it is changed and it has changed under Zach Brown a bit. Um, and he just made some, you know, difficult decisions. He should have won the championship with Ferrari. They messed up the race in Abu Dhabi when he got stuck behind. Uh, who was the Russian? I can't remember. Uh, the Russian driver. I oh, can't remember. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, Red Bull were covering Weber. Ferrari, Ferrari were covering Weber. Red Bull were covering Alonso. And uh, everyone just let uh, uh, Vettel go through and win the championship. So he should have won a championship there. Had he made some different kinds of decisions, he might have been a four or five times world champion. He's an extraordinary talent. Put him in anything, and Alonso is just brilliant. I think he was a little bit too cocky um, it, it, when he was sort of in his mid-late 20s. Oh, okay. But um, he, I, I, he just is something quite phenomenal. You know, he, he just is a wonderful, wonderful racing driver. Brilliant. Uh, again, that just adds to the whole dynamic of Formula One. Beautiful to watch. Yeah. Sasha, yeah. you've been an absolute legend to chat to you. Really appreciate your time. Thank you for all this Formula One insights. And I really, sure. really hope that the next time we chat, it's about the Formula One being hosted in South Africa. Can't wait for that. It would be really, really great. Yeah, thank you very much, Ryan. It's been great to chat to you. And uh, definitely, as soon as we get the information, let's chat again. 100%.